In Search of a Restream Time, Archaeology and Early Literature by James P. Mallory. Chapter 7. Warfare and Weapons. Ogma unsheathed the sword and cleaned it. Then the sword told what had been done by it, because it was the habit of swords at that time to recount the deeds that had been done by them whenever they were unsheathed. In 1897 BC, the Fir Balg, having just learned that the Tuatha Dé Danann had invaded Ireland, dispatched their toughest warrior, Shrang, to spy on the enemy. He set off with his sword, shield and two spears, typical of any warrior, but also wearing a four-cornered helmet, carrying an iron club. Seeing him approach, the Tuatha Dé sent out one of their own warriors, Brez. Encountering one another, they were both astonished and fearful of the other's weapons, and Shreng crouched down and hid behind his shield as did Brez. They then discovered that they both spoke Irish, as they had a shared ancestry from Nemed, and they compared their weapons in a form of a show and tell. They were most impressed with the differences between their spears, Shreng displayed his heavy javelin that he called a uh, Krusech, and Brez foresaw that such a weapon would result in broken bones and gushing gore. For his part, Shreng was in fear of Brez's sharp pointed slag, as tradition had it that no one in Ireland had encountered a sharp pointed weapon until the coming of the Tuatha Dé Danann. This scene was seized upon by Eugene O'Curry to distinguish between the weapons of two of Ireland's past ethnic groups, and he scoured the archaeological collections of the Royal Irish Academy to find the appropriate weapons described by the Calf Mega Turid. His discussion was then augmented and illustrated by W. K. Sullivan. The slag was identified with a range of Irish Bronze Age spearheads, but the compulsion to find a weapon that did not look like a typical sharp pointed spear, a furball crusach, lured O'Curry and Sullivan to compare the literary descriptions of weapons ranging from continental swords to Irish halberds, daggers, and rapiers. Warfare. That the Ulster cycle is primarily concerned with warfare is obvious when we examine the cultural vocabulary, architecture, material culture, names of plants and animals, etc., and score the words according to the number of different tales in which they occur. The top ten most widely found in order of frequency are Claydab, Sword, Gay, Spear, Skiff, Shield, Carpet, Chariot, Dun, Fort, Slabrad, Chain. Brat, mantle, slag, spear, chris, belt, coup, hound. The mythological cycle is quite similar, and its top five items of material culture are the sword, chariot, shield, and two different words for spear. It is clear then that warfare is the primary semantic field of the oldest Irish tradition. In the Iron Age, at that time of Catu Butos, the evidence for weapons is hardly abundant. The sword was of iron, though there is also evidence for wooden toy question mark swords as well. But Katu Butos may not have wanted to show off his fun-sized sword outside his homeland, as the blades of Irish swords were embarrassingly short, the longest only reaching about 58 centimetres. Most were severely reduced versions of continental and British swords. The hilts were made of organic material such as bone, antler or wood, or if we trust a slightly questionable description of Irish sword hilts by the 3rd century AD, Gaius Julius Solanus, the tusks of great sea mammals. That longer swords may have existed is suggested by the remains of a now lost sword from Lambay Island. Also, Katu Butos may have encountered a sword with a metal hilt in the shape of a man, had the Ballyshannon sword hilt found off the coast of Donegal, ever found its way to shore in the first place. It was an import from Gaul and not native Irish. 
Katabutos would have carried his sword in a scabbard made of bronze and highly decorated in the Latin style. Naturally, the scabbards were as short as the swords they contained. Katabutos would also have carried a spear his head ranged in size and could have been about as long as the sword he was carrying. At the opposite end of the spear there may have been a bronze spear butt whose form could range from a long tube to a flat doorknob. From the sparse evidence surviving we might also permit Katabutos to defend himself with a wooden shield covered with leather. The later Katabutos would have continued the tradition of fighting with a relatively short sword, although now we find some types with a blade that expanded as it neared the point, which indicated its use as a slashing sword. Also from the Germanic world, presumably via the Anglo-Saxons, there appeared single-edged swords like the Scramasax. All the swords so far have organic hilts, and they would be regarded as small, certainly compared with the Viking swords that followed them. The longest Irish sword has a total length of 66.7 centimetres, while the shortest Viking sword known in Ireland, dismissed as a toy sword by some, is still 10 centimetres longer. The spearheads would tend to be either leaf-shaped or with a shoulder, as one finds among the Anglo-Saxons. By now, if not earlier, our knowledge of Iron Age Irish shields being so poor that Irish had adapted a small round shield with a metal boss in the centre. The weapons of Cabot's time see a continuation of those of the earlier period, with the addition of new weapons borrowed or modelled on those from the Germanic world. The Vikings introduced truly massive slashing swords with metal hilts, sometimes ornamented with precious metal. The blades may also have been decorated with damascening. The earlier spears, which were usually fastened with a single rivet, now might have several rivets as well as ferrules. The Norse reintroduced the bow and arrow to Ireland, and the remains of a wooden bow dating to about the 10th century were recovered from Ballinderry I. Viking sites in Ireland have also yielded hundreds of iron arrowheads. And to the previous weapons, one should now add the axe, which the Irish took to as a cheaper substitute for the sword. For protection, the Irish maintained the shield with its small metal boss, but otherwise lacked helmets. And the only evidence for chainmail remains undated. Sword. The sword was the primary weapon of the hero in the Ulster Tales. In the contest for the championship of Ulster, the silver medalist Connell is defeated by a group of Geniti, ferocious female warriors, and in flight he leaves his spears, but the fled Brickran notes that he does manage to hang on to his chief weapon, his sword, our archetypical warrior poet Cavett also carried a sword that he brandished over Ness, with whom he would eventually favour the Ulster King, Conchobar. As a major weapon, the sword was an appropriate high status gift. In a very late tale full of excruciating exaggeration, Fergus presents 3,000 swords. Like King Arthur, several heroes wielded very special swords. The earliest of these was born by Nuada. Sorry, I should have said. The earliest of these was born by Nuadu, who was armed with one of the great talismans of the Tuatha de Danann, a special sword that guaranteed victory when unsheathed. A few swords bore names, although the Irish were not in the same league as the Norse, who had over 175 named swords. I'm going to go to the footnote for that one. I've not been reading footnotes, but that sounds pretty interesting. Seven. Uh, ugh. What's it say? What's it say? What's it say? 
Ah, there's nothing there, it's just a reference. The Ulster King, Fergus MacLeaty, had a special sword, the Calad Bulg, whose name is Cognate, with that of the Welsh Caledwich, born by King Arthur which is more, more widely known in some form of Latin corruption as Caliburnus or Excalibur. Caliburnus, Caladbog, Excalibur, hmm, interesting. Fergus employed this in his fight against a sea monster in Loch Rudrig. After his death, it was passed on to Fergus MacRoy, his possible doublet. The later Fergus famously had this sword stolen while he was in dalliance with Maeve, but returned to him in the final battle of the town, where, when he was confronted by Cúhillan and told to desist from slaying his fellow Ulsterman, he gripped it with both hands and lopped off the tops of the three hills. Cúhillan bore the Cúdin, Cútichen, hard head stealing, which could cut through stone, tree and bone, and was useful in depriving the giant gall of his head. The partner of Deirdre, Noise, also carried a special sword gained from the sea god Mananan MacLear, which was later employed to behead himself and his two brothers with a single stroke. The sword was naturally worn on the left side, where it is often specifically located at the waist or on a belt. It might, however, also be worn over the shoulder. Only once do we find someone with his short on his right side, and that is ascribed to the giant Gaul who wields a sword 30 feet long. And only in the case of Fergus MacRoich and his Caladbolg do we find someone requiring both hands to wield his sword. There are three main words for the sword in the tales. Claydab, its diminutive Claydbine, little sword, and Kolg. By far the most frequent word for sword is Claydab. The diminutive is very rarely employed, but the Kolg is mentioned over 30 times. A similar word to Claydab also occurs in the Britonic languages. For example, Middle Welsh Cledif and Cornish Cled, where it also indicates sword, and all these words appear to derive from a root meaning beat or strike, which makes good sense if the sword was basically for striking or slashing. More important, however, is the fact that the Irish word is not inherited from some earlier Celtic form. It is a loan word from British that entered Irish in about the 6th century or possibly a century earlier. In fact, the Roman gladius sword may be a loan from Celtic, Cladios striker. In short, Cladab is a name that Catubutas or Capad might have applied to a weapon, but not the Iron Age Catubutos. When considering both the construction and provenance of a sword, it is useful to keep the blade and hilt separate as the two might have very different origins. In the tales, the blade attracts no less than 58 adjectives, while the hilt is qualified by another 21 adjectives. Many of these are not particularly informative. A sword might be a cane, beautiful, or crawdy, bloody, and blades are frequently described as red in obvious anticipation of their gory use. But some of them do give us a physical image of what the authors of the tales might have had in mind. The most frequent adjectives employed are in order. Trom, heavy. Moor, large. Tortbulica, heavy striking. Tredegher, hard sharp. And class lehen, to move to air. The blade, it seems, is living up to the etymology of the word and is often described as a large, heavy slashing blade how large the sword was we cannot tell, as the few measurements provided involve a considerable dollop of hyperbole, 
such as in the case of Conair Moore's giant bodyguard McKecht, who has a sword 30 feet long, or a problematic comparison with several warriors having swords as long as a weaver's beam. The inspiration for comparing the length of a weapon to that of a weaver's beam is fairly certainly the Bible, in which Goliath's spear is likened to a weaver's beam. Mayor West has recently argued that the Irish words translated as weaver's beam and employed to indicate what the prophetess Fidelm held in one hand when she foretold the destruction of Maeve's army, the length of swords or the shins of a woman who seeks admission into Dadurga's hostel actually indicated a weaving sword or a fringe sword, weaving tools which tend to measure somewhere between about 20 and 50 centimetres. The names of these tools, Cladab Garn and Cladab Corf, she suggests were mistaken glosses on the Latin Lechia Torium that was used to describe the length of Goliath's spear and did indeed mean weaver's beam. Her arguments make good sense for Ferdelm's weaving tool, but raise problems when comparing the length of a hero sword with a weaving instrument that only measured circa 20 to 50, 20, uh, measured about 20 to 50 centimetres, perhaps a bit larger. This is roughly the same size range of Iron Age, average circa 38 centimetres, and early medieval Irish swords the longest measuring 66 centimetres. Consequently, why would the author of the passage tell us that men bore three black huge swords, whose length was well within the range of an average pitiful Iron Age sword? The image of a slashing sword is reinforced by an analysis of precisely how the claydeb was used. On at least 21 occasions, the verb associated with its use is binaid strike beat hew. This verb is regularly employed in describing decapitations, but also in basic combat, such as when Cuhulain comes so irritated with one of his would-be opponents that he struck a tarkamal on the crown of his head and clove him down to the navel. In addition to these edge-centred acts, we also have the description of how the Ulster men when telling of their combats, would lay their swords over their thighs. As they lied, the blade would turn against them. Sorry, I misread that there. In addition to these edge-centred acts, we also have the description of how the Ulstermen and telling of their combats, would lay their swords over their thighs, and, if they lied, the blade would turn against them. Swords are also used for some fine cutting, as when Conla, Cuhillan's son, crops his father's hair with a single stroke, just as his father had inflicted the same humiliation on the hapless Etarkamal, a food dispenser. Fafreach is described cutting up joints of meat in the palm of his hand with his sword. One of the displays of a martial skills involved the edge feet of a sword, and on several occasions we find a sword being thrown either against an opponent or at a flock of birds. On the other hand, we also find that the business end of the sword could be its point as when Cahern, falling for one of the oldest ploys in the world, runs his sword through a pillar stone, disguised as his adversary. Or when Cahern probes the trap that Ulstermen find themselves in when he runs his sword through the walls of the iron house into which they have been lured. There is also the strange image of Cormac's nine followers, who twirl the points of their swords on their fingers, and the swords then extend themselves. Fergus swears by the point of his admittedly very special sword, and Cuchulain threatens to bend every joint and limb beneath the point of his sword, 
but these are rare exceptions to an overwhelming image of a slashing sword where the point could obviously also be employed. To all of these descriptions we can add the mention of a single-edged sword carried by the Karakht ambassador and the god Luke. Such a sword clearly derives from the Iron Age when the Irish adopted Germanic sword types that resembled the Anglo-Saxon Scramasax. The adjectives describing the hilt are generally more specific and most frequently are ordurn, gold hilted, followed by intlace, inlaid, argot, silver, and det, tooth, or perhaps ivory. There is also mention of a white hilt. There are also at least a half dozen mentions of an eltadet, hilt guard, ivory, which utilizes a Germanic loanword, elta. To indicate the hilt guard. The image of the Kleideb is thus a large heavy slashing sword with a hilt diver of some organic material or more often of metal such as gold or silver which can be inlaid. The sword is large and strong enough to cleave a man in two or behead a victim. In the Ulster Tales the, the diminutive clade bein little sword dagger is confined to Cúhalin in the town, where he wields either four or eight swords in one or both hands, with a full sword, claydeb or cog in his other hand. The word for the second type of sword, cog, has cognates in other Celtic languages, but these do not return the same. These do not return the meaning sword, but rather some other pointed object, such as Old Welsh colgan, on of barley. Even in Irish, the word does not simply indicate a sword, but anything pointed, piercing instrument, sting, stab, thrust. The only possible exception to its general meaning is the name of the Caledonian king Calgacus, whose name might mean possessing a sword, and into whose mouth Tacitus places his best known quotation. The Romans have made the world a desert and called it peace. Huh. This same Calgacus helps supply the original name of Northern Ireland's second city, Derry, which was originally, at least before the Christian association of St Columba, known as Deir Calgish, Oak Grove of Calgacus. Etymologically, then, the Calg would appear to have been some type of stabbing or thrusting weapon, the business end of which was its point rather than its blade. Descriptions I can't ask, I can't believe that, the um, Derry and Calgacus from Scotland, it's uh, really interesting, nice to know. Anyway, descriptions of the blade of the Calg are not very informative. The blade is Cruid, hard, or Ernacht, bare. It also may be Dyriuch, straight, and descriptions of the hilt are entirely limited to some form of hilt or and descriptions of the hilt are entirely limited to some form of organic hilt of tooth, tusk or ivory. Only twice do we find the colg in action. In both instances also employ the verb benaid, strike. In the second recension of the teen, Cuhillan's foster brother, Ferdiad, struck Cuhillan with an ivory hilted colg that goes into Cuhillan's breast. In one of the oldest references to the town, we also hear how Cúhillin will strike a backstroke with his colg. Although one can make a limited case for distinguishing between a colg and a claydeb, they appear to be worn in the same way, i.e. either suspended from the left side or over the shoulder. If we draw all this evidence together, 
we find a weapon that both in terms of its etymology and the descriptions of its hilt indicates a thrusting sword of some form of organic and never metal hilt and the descriptions of its use involving a slashing action are however comparable to the clay damp. Where do we put these weapons in time? It is clear that the clay dab makes a very poor fit with what we know about Iron Age weapons. The swords of Katubutos time were short organic hilted, primarily used for thrusting and not called a clay dab. The swords of the Ulster Cycle are large, heavy slashing swords that might have organic hilts, but more often are described with decorated metal ones. By the time of Katu Butas, Irish swords were somewhat larger and with their expanded blades certainly could have served for slashing. The introduction of a weapon similar to the Anglo-Saxon Skramasax could also account for the few descriptions of single-edged swords. The references to grooved swords are unfortunately useless for dating purposes because wide shallow grooves on swords can be found from the Iron Age to the Viking period. There would, of course, still have been the problem of the metal hilts decorated with gilt copper alloy, silver strips or sheet silver, which would only appear in time of Kafbat. In short, it appears that the clay deb was probably introduced in the time of Katu Butis, but much of its description was updated after the Norse incursions into Ireland. And one way out of tying the sword descriptions to earlier than the Viking raids on Ireland is to suggest that the Irish obtained the image of their main weapon from abroad. By the 5th century, we occasionally find both silver and gold employed in covering the hilts of swords in southern Scandinavia, and in the 6th or and 7th centuries, a new sword type was being taken up across the Germanic world, including Anglo-Saxon England, which included metal hilts, some of which were either gilded or of solid gold. By the 9th century, there are pommels and guards decorated with silver, which clearly matches some of the descriptions of the Ulster tales although there is no evidence for Anglo-Saxon hilt forms in Viking Dublin. An alternative to looking abroad for archaeological parallels is recourse to the literary evidence available to the Irish. Although the Bible might be our first stop, we can note that other than the odd case of a flashing or two-edged sword, there are almost no actual descriptions of swords in the over 460 citations in the Bible. The only instance offering is, although the Bible might be our first stop, we can note that other than the odd case of a flashing or two-edged sword, there are almost no actual descriptions of swords in the over 460 citations in the Bible. The only instance offering a not very convincing parallel with the Irish derives from the Apocrypha, uh, where Jeremiah gives to Judas a golden sword, Gladius Aureus. But this seems to be slight reason for all the descriptions of gold-hilted swords in the Ulster Tales. Just going to the footnote now about the Apocrypha. Two Maccabees, 1515. Also, the only reference to a sword hilt is in Judges 3.22, which is not described. Right. Um, as for classical parallels, there are a few possibilities, but classical sword descriptions are seldom as detained as the ones we find in the Ulster Tales. Gilded swords appear in both the Aeneid and the Latin Iliad, while 
Virgil also provides us with an ivory sword and a broadsword and slato. One of the frequent descriptions in the Ulster Tales, but these are not particularly forceful parallels, and in fact it seems probable that when an Irish translator encountered descriptions of weapons in Latin, he shook his head despairingly and muttered boring, and then inserted typical descriptions of Irish swords. This is particularly the case with the Irish account of the Roman Civil War, where we not only have numerous references to Irish weapons, but Julius Caesar even arms himself as if he were Cullen and performs an Irish weapons feat. Just going to the footnote again. That's funny. That is funny. Ah, it's not saying much. The cog could linguistically go back to the Iron Age, and the etymology of its name is congruent with the small Irish Iron Age swords. Its organic hilt could also be compatible with the time of Katubutos, or his successor Katubutas. In fact, recently a sword hilt made of whalebone has been recovered from Collierstown, County Meath, dating to the 5th or 6th centuries. In this sense, it might be a genuine relict from an earlier time than when the tales were written down in the medieval period, comparable in a way to Homer's description of bronze swords with silver nails. But the few occasions depicting its use suggest that by the time the tales were recorded, the weapon was imagined to function the same way as a clay dab, or in other words, as a slashing rather than thrusting sword. The sword was carried in a scabbard, for which the Irish employed three words. The first, furbolg, literally, man bag. Ha! <laughs> so it is. was usually the term for the sack in which one carried board game pieces. But in the toyne, it is also once used to describe a sword scabbard, here made of white silver and rings of gold. More common in more common is the intech, which is generally described simply as warlike bath. Finally, there is true ale scabbard, where we find one with interlaced design of bright silver or of fendruin. Of all metal scabbards are known from the Irish Iron Age. Just looking at the picture of one and it is beautiful. Absolutely beautiful. These are of bronze and not silver or the white metal that is indicated by the word fundrun, as they are consistently described in the tales, at least where metal is involved. Silver scabbards are unknown in Ireland, although they can be found on the continent at least as early as the 5th century, and by the 6th century there are silver mounts known from neighbouring Anglo-Saxon scabbards. Leather scabbards with interlaced designs are also known from Ireland. As for external literary sources, scabbards are not described in the Bible, nor are usual classical sources. Judging by what little evidence we have, it is unlikely that the scabbard descriptions are residual images derived from the time of Kadubudos, but rather, once again, they are more comparable to the later use of silver in scabbards on the continent. Headhunting. One behavioural act is intimately associated with the sword, the decapitation of one's fallen opponent, a practice abundantly in evidence among the continental Celts, and frequently utilised to emphasise the archaic nature of the Ulster cycle. From the very beginning of the toyne, the prophetess warns Meave that her invasion of Ulster will result in her leaving a thousand severed heads. 
and Cúhalin does everything he can to fulfil this prediction until, at the end of his life, he himself is beheaded by Lugate. The taking of an opponent's head as a war trophy was so much a part of the ritual of warfare that, on occasion, defeated warriors actually requested they be beheaded by their opponent. For example, Lugate de Connell. Once a head had been detached, it would serve as a trophy that might be brandished at your enemies, impaled on either a spit, a forked branch, a stone, or the ramparts of a fort. The Ulster hero Connell claimed that he never passed the night without the head of the slain Connacht warrior as his pillow. The most elaborate treatment involved removing the brains from the skull of an opponent and mixing them with lime in order to form a more solid ball-like trophy. Oh man, I feel sick! <laughs> Such a brain ball was stolen by the Connacht champion Ket, who later slung it at Conquabar embedding it in the Ulster King's own skull until it leapt out because he overexerted himself in his delusional attack on Jewish trees. There are two issues with employing head trophies as a chronological marker in early Ireland. How old is the practice and how was it accomplished? The great Neolithic passage of Nauf also boasts evidence of Iron Age occupation and burial, including the interment of two males who had been decapitated, and so head-taking may well have been known to Katu Putos during the Iron Age. The burials are dated around 40 BC to 100 AD, but this does not tell us that the occurrence of head-taking in the tales must necessarily be a direct legacy of such Iron Age behaviour. For a scan of the annals clearly indicates that while beheading was sporadically recorded from the 2nd century onwards, by the 9th century through to the 12th century, the Irish were routinely taking either each other's heads or exchanging decapitations with their Norse intruders. In short, it would have been difficult for an Irish writer working in the time of Cathbad to describe warfare without including some coverage of beheading. In fact, when the Irish set about translating classical works, works such as Dares, Phrygius, and Namic account of the Trojan War, they couldn't resist inserting instances of head taking that were never there in the Latin original. As for the method of beheading, if we recall that Iron Age swords are quite small, they would hardly be capable of hacking off a head with a single blow, as is routinely described in the Scala. On the other hand, there is little doubt that a metre-long heavy Viking sword could do the job. Possibly some of the wide-bladed swords of the early medieval period might also serve. This is a fine call because I can hardly claim that one could not remove a head with an Irish Iron Age weapon. Theoretically you could cut off a head with a penknife, but I doubt that it could be accomplished with anything remotely like the panache one finds described in the Ulster Tales. So I'm looking at uh, a figure here Head hunting in the Irish annals. Black heads equals decapitations involving Vikings. Grey heads equals decapitations amongst the Irish. Yeah. From um, the mid 9th century. You frequently see Viking decapitations. And then from um, 900 until. 1200, you see Viking decapitation sporadically. But um, throughout the whole first millennium and first two 
uh, centuries of the second millennium, you see frequent um, Irish uh, decapitations. But that's from the uh, books, I think, rather than from the archaeology. I'm not too sure about that, where that came from. I'm tired. Spear. While there were few names for swords in early Irish, there was a large vocabulary concerning spears that Eugene O'Curry believed were associated with the different population groups of Ireland. Some of them are confined to a single individual such as Cúhillan, who as a boy played with his boonsach, literally a rod or staff, but here clearly a wooden javelin that Cúhillan would toss into the air and then catch before it landed a motif possibly lifted from classical literature. Note that in the Irish version of Statius Achilles, Achilles could shoot an arrow and reach the spot where the arrow landed as fast as the arrow itself. Right. Um, when older, Cúhillan possessed two differently named small javelins a cletine and a curtke. Although small, these weapons could do considerable damage as when Cúhillan casts his curtke at Buid, which went into his armpit, and his liver on the other side broke in two at the impact of the spear. Another weapon, the Luinach, is also confined in the Ulster Tales to Cúhillan. It's also, it's only Distinguishing feature is that it is red. In addition, he possessed the Dubsach. Calcair MacDuchir was associated with the Loon Lance, which he employed to kill a particularly savage hound. It was also employed by Dubfach. <laughs> when he had it on loan from Keltshire, having been handed down to Keltshire from all the way back to the Battle of Magturid. The spear is so potent that when its spear heat seizes it, sparks fly from its heat and it must be quenched in a cauldron, an act that W.K. Sullivan argued was a poorly understood reference to the tempering of steel. In the Ulster Tales, the spear of Cuscred is likened to a candle, candle light, evidently a metaphor for a spear. This weapon is described in detail with a silver band running from the shaft to the grip, with the bands of silver alternating with rings of gold from the butt to the socket. Another metaphor is tuir, a tower or pillar, invariably the pillar of a palace, which is used to describe very large spears. Conal Curdach employed his cool glass in avenging Cúhillan's death. The warrior with an aversion to doctors, Cefern, used a beer, which usually refers to as a steak, spike or spit, but here is a thrusting spear which he plied on his enemies and of which he was also on the receiving end. The commonest terms are gay and slag, which might suggest that they should be formally distinguished. Unfortunately, the distinction between a lance and a javelin is not always clear. In most cases where there is action described, the gay functions as a javelin, on occasions it is equated with both as a curtke and a cletine, both indicating a javelin. In other duels, Cúhillan throws his gay at his opponent. Nad Crantail, while elsewhere he is on the receiving end of fourteen javelins hurled by Maeve's followers. The gay bolga, see below, that Cúhillan employs to kill his foster brother Ferdiad, is also simply referred to as a gay. The descriptions of the gay vary considerably so that it is clear that the name conveys 
The name covers a variety of weapons. It is sometimes described as broad-bladed and long. The spearhead was also riveted on, in one case with three rivets, and in the case of the great warrior Kelchir, 30 rivets were required. In one instance, the rivets were of gold. A peculiar motif is the double-pointed gay with a sharpened head on the butt as well as the head. This leg is another word that can be used generically for spear or for either a throwing weapon or a thrusting weapon. While one might imagine that one weapon is a lance and the other is a javelin, we still find Cúhalin brandishing his two spears, Slag, when his javelin, Cletine, smashes woods, ribs and pierces his heart. It is also called a slag. On the other hand, Connell thrusts his slag through the back of Ilan, and there are many other examples of warriors dispatched by a thrust from a slag. When one has scraped away the less informative descriptions of the slag, for example a sharp, strong, shining, we are still left with a considerable variety of adjectives. They may be broad, rigid and riveted. In the Toyn, Elan carried a slag with a bent point, while the aged and naked Iliach had two gapped spearheads. The most elaborately described was the one borne by Fergus that had three rings and bands of silver. Fergna had a spear with a gold socket, and the spears of Cúhalin and Ferdiad included the fongs and hard flax. This reference to the use of an amentum, a leather strap attached to a javelin that increased both the distance that it could be thrown and its accuracy, unfortunately only occurs in this relatively lurked insertion into the toyn. The Irish were certainly aware of the use of the amentum as it was briefly described in Isidore and they employed it in their translations of classical literature. For this reason, we may be suspicious of any claim that this is a relic of earlier days. Although that may be possible, the Gauls, for example, also employed the Amentum very frequently in the sense that no warrior could be caught dead without one, we find the Ulster heroes carrying a slag coikrind, a five-pronged or pointed spear. Cúhalin carries two. Several are described as having a ring of silver or gold, with deluxe versions such as those carried by Bov's group, having ribs of gold, silver and bronze, or fifty rivets of Findruin, along with gold. This weapon defies classification and has no obvious biblical or, as far as I can find among the texts, obviously known to the medieval Irish, classical parallels. Although not discussed by Sullivan, he did consider the appearance of the Faga Foga Black, which was described in the Book of Lismore, a 15th century manuscript, as a weapon that had five prongs or barbs that were on each side of it, and each sickle or barb of them would cut a hair against a stream. Sullivan, in Sullivan illustrated such a weapon with what he classified as a military fork, but precisely what the medieval Irish had in mind. A trident with two extra prongs, maybe? Remains a mystery. The slag also came in a fun-sized version, the slagin. And in contrast to the slag and gay, we have the foga, evidently a smaller spear that served as a javelin. As with the selg, koikrind, a number of the descriptions indicate a forked weapon. One is described as possessing rivets of burning gold, while another has fongs attached 
and rivets on Fimdrin. The Lagan, another weapon that the RIA dictionary treats as a broad-headed spear, is clearly large as it covers the Luin of Kelchir and Dubfach. While one might regard such a heavy spear as primarily being used for thrusting in at least one tail, we learn that it can also be cast and in doings can kill nine men at a single go. The Mane is defined by the RIA dictionary as a large spear with a broad head and a sharp point that by now, as the reader can see, is pretty well indistinguishable from most of the other spears. In some contexts, it is clearly a thrusting weapon, as when Cúhalin suggests de Ferdiad, that since they have not managed to kill each other with throwing spears, they must as well have a shot at bringing their duel to an end with great long spears for thrusting. In another tale, after Main has skewered Conquerbar with his javelin slag, he then plies his money on him. On other occasions, however, there is some evidence that the weapon could be thrown. A recurring description tells us that it is mounted on a slender shaft or a shaft of ash. We also read that the spear was perforated or bore neck rings. Finally, we have that problematic weapon of the Firbolg, the Krusach. In the Toyn, the Krusach is used interchangeably with the Mini. Here it is described as venomous. Maeve is also described as possessing a Krusach that is keen, sharp edged, and light. We will return to the Krusach below when we discuss the first battle of Mag Turid. Uh, if we try to compare this abundance of spear terminology with the archaeological record, we must face the depressing problem of a real paucity of archaeological evidence for the Iron Age. For example, we only have about half a dozen spearheads that we can assign to this period. Moreover, the appearance of the spearhead in Ireland, from its emergence in the early Bronze Age until the historical period, has not changed so radically that it permits us to date most of the descriptions with any great confidence. There are both narrow and wide spearheads, leaf-shaped and shouldered, and that the shaft may be of ash tails as next to nothing as that was the main material for spear shafts throughout both the prehistoric and historic periods. I once suggested a comparison between references to gapped spears and types of perforated spears known from the long late Bronze Age. I added that word long in, that shouldn't be there. And more interestingly from the Iron Age where small perforations are to be seen in spears from Rudston, County Louth, and Corofin, County Clare. But it is more likely that this is not intended as a design element, but to suggest that they were simply rusted through as they are not associated with a comical attack of a naked old warrior riding in a dilapidated chariot. On the other hand, descriptions involving silver ornament mean that a large number of the spears simply have no place in the Irish Iron Age. In fact, Catherine Swift has compared the elaborate Kandel of Cuscrade with its rings of silver and gold to a Viking period spear from Woodstown, County Waterford, whose socket was ornamented with bands of silver. As we have seen above, rivets, either functional or for decoration, are often mentioned in the tales sometimes in large numbers on a single weapon. From the Iron Age, we have a spearhead from Lisna Crocker, County Antrim, that possessed two rivets. Generally, the number of rivets seems to have increased over time and multiple decorative rivets are well known from Viking Age sites in Ireland. There's certainly no evidence for multiple decorative rivets from Iron Age Ireland. Finally, 
there is a factor of negative evidence. Generally, we would not equate the lack of some item being described in the tales with its genuine absence, but there are so many descriptions of warriors with their full kit, especially anything that might be taken as bling, that the absence of any mention of bronze spear butts is a problem. These comprise the second largest category of second of metal objects dated to the Irish Iron Age. Over 65 examples are known. As we have seen above, the only references we have to a pointed spear butt derives from Fintan's band in the Toyn, which suggests a shaft with a spearhead on both ends, the Ulster cycle equivalent of a Sif's double-pointed lightsaber, maybe. The Iron Age spear butts terminated in either knobs or, when tubular or conical, flattened ends, and were certainly not intended as weapons, although iron ferrules could be found in some Iron Age spears on the continent, and even from the later Viking period, where two possible ferrules have been recovered, they do not appear to have been attached to a spear. Had the tales routinely described the shiny metal butt of the spearhead, this would have displayed the type of privileged knowledge that should have been confined to the Iron Age and indicated a genuine retention of an ancient cultural motif. It would have been the Homeric version of a boar tusk helmet or a full body shield, but the descriptions of the spears fail to do this.